Welcome to Real Vision. It's Wednesday, November 11, 2020, just after market close in New York. This is the Real Vision Daily Briefing. I'm joined shortly by our managing editor, Ed Harrison. But first, with the day's stories, Jack Farley. Thanks, Ash. Markets resumed their ascent today with the tech-dominated Nasdaq leading the way. The announcement of the Pfizer vaccine continues to shape markets in ways that are evolving. The vaccine needs to be stored and transported at extremely cold temperatures, as low as negative 90 degrees Fahrenheit, in fact. So we're seeing deep freezing corporations and vaccine logistic companies having a monumental rally, companies like Daihan Scientific and Snowman Logistics. One sector that went on a tear on Monday's vaccine news was the movie exhibitors. Their sales had been absolutely obliterated by shutdowns. You look at AMC's third quarter, their sales were down 91% year over year, but the prospect of a vaccine has breathed new life into this industry whose future is on the knife's edge. Cinemark and Cineworld are holding firm today, but AMC is actually down 11% today as doubts about their liquidity heighten. AMC is the largest exhibitor in the U.S. and a staple of American life. Corona cases in the U.S. are up 69% over the past two weeks and deaths are up 23%. And in New York, the case fatality rate is 2.31%. If it goes to 3%, all public schools are going to go remote. As we enter this winter of profound uncertainty, companies are looking to buffer their balance sheet, whether it's debt or equity. They're grasping for as much cash as they can get their hands on. Carnival Cruises and American Airlines announced plans on Tuesday to issue additional equity, and speculative-grade corporates are tapping the high-yield bond markets, companies like Antero, Continental, and Tervita. By the way, AMC, which had issued equity last month, is now double-dipping, offering 20 million additional shares to the market. It makes sense for these corporates. Credit spreads have continued to sink, both in investment grade and high yield, with lenders all too happy to oblige companies' need for cash. It makes sense. Bill Ackman of Pershing Square just announced he put back on his short of investment grade credit. That should be interesting to watch going forward. Is Bill Ackman someone you want us to interview on Real Vision? Let us know in the comments below. By the way, all this risk on sentiment over the past week has dealt a minor blow to the U.S. Treasury market. Yields have risen as much as 20 basis points on the long end of the curve. ETFs like TLT are taking their medicine, but hey, the money has to come from somewhere, right? Meanwhile, on the European continent, the head of the EU's unit on winding down failing banks is sounding the alarm about non-performing loans. Elke Koenig, chair of the Single Resolution Board, is urging European banks to, quote, be aware that non-performing loans are coming and that the best thing to do is address them early. That is the best thing that we can do for the time being. And after that, it's steering through the fog. The European Central Bank has continued to pursue vigorous intervention in the money market funds, even after the Fed and the BOJ have wound down those programs. Whether the ECB has an appetite for supporting up to 1.5 trillion euros in sour loans, we'll see. By the way, before I let you go, over the next two weeks, we're going to do an interview series that might change the way you look at markets. It's perhaps the best series of interviews that we've done in the history of Real Vision. We all know that we're in an uncertain territory, the fate of this virus and how it impacts economic behavior. It's very up in the air. Fiscal stimulus overdue, central banks scrambling to pay for the cracks, markets at all time highs. We all know this, you know this. But how do you make sense of this? No one knows that. So the next two weeks, over the next two weeks, we're gonna be speaking to the best investors in the world, the brightest financial minds to help answer this question for you and your portfolio. So Brent Johnson is gonna be speaking to Russell Napier, Rouse talking to Real Vision favorite Hugh Hendry, Kirill Sokoloff's gonna be interviewing investing legend Sam Zell, Mike Green talking to the world's most accomplished short seller, Jim Chanos. Jim Grant is coming back to speak to William White about the state of central banking. Kyle Bass interviewing a forensic accountant, Steve Clapham, who's done a deep dive in the weeds on Chinese tech stocks. I mean, my God, Rouse talking to Chamath Palihapitiya. I mean, what? Even I have trouble believing it. I mean, I might have to pinch myself. So it starts next week, next Monday, although this Friday you might have a little surprise. So stay tuned for that. And with that, let's go over to Ash and Ed. Thanks, Jack. Welcome back, Ed. Thank you, and happy Veterans Day to you, the real Veterans Day. And happy real Veterans Day to you, and thank you for your service, Ed. Thank you. And, you know, uh, by the way, uh, given the fact that we just uh, listened to Jack Hollywood Farley, I just wanted to uh, give him a shout out because tomorrow I understand he's going to be the host of this show, sitting in your chair, if you will. Sitting in my chair, but uh, 15 blocks further south. Yes, exactly. Yeah.
You know, talking of Jack, he had some really interesting stories in the intro uh, that I think kind of bring up some of the issues that we've been talking about a little bit more broadly, a little bit more structurally. Uh, the EU is urging banks uh, to begin preparing for NPLs, those are non-performing loans. Uh, U.S. Con companies are con continuing to stockpile progressively more cash. And finally, there's a story out today that Bill Ackman uh, is talking about too much complacency in markets, once again, shorting investment grade credits, uh, which is uh, very similar to the bet he made last time, where he made $2.6 billion, I believe, earlier in the year uh, on the declines in economic activity from the COVID crisis. Ed, you've been thinking about this big picture for a very long time. You've been talking about the potential for a double dip. Where are you in terms of your framework right now? Yeah, so I mean, you know, we spoke uh, to that, and I, I, there are so many ideas that are going through my mind right now after the election. You know, because we obviously had that COVID-related uh, sell-off because of what happened in Europe in terms of the lockdowns, and I think that was appropriate given the fact that Europe is such a large contributor to global GDP growth, and that they were going and doing the most draconian thing, locking down their their economies. But the, the then the secondary question is, uh, what happens in the U.S.? And I, I'm definitely firmly of the belief uh, on two two fronts. One, that the backward-looking data in the U.S. are good. That is, is that we're looking at numbers that suggest that the U.S. looks good uh, to be able to power forward. It would be good if it weren't for the virus. The yeah. second is, is that the virus is a big problem. Uh, I think that the things that you and I were talking about uh, maybe two weeks ago have been borne out by reality. That is, is, is that the numbers in the U.S., I said, are definitely going to rise. They're going to rise a lot, and it's going to be epidemic proportions. And what we've seen since that time is an absolute you know, mushrooming in the case count. Uh, the death count is up to 1,400 today. Uh, the highest that we saw was in the 2,000 range. Uh, in the first wave. So I honestly think that we'll get to those levels. I was talking uh, around the 1500 level. Uh, uh, we're already near that level now. So things are, are, are looking really bad. And the question is, for the US, given the fact that we haven't had a lockdown yet, will there be a lockdown eventually? And what sort of economic outcome uh, can we expect uh, given that we already expect bad things to happen in Europe. Yeah. You know, Ed, inspired by your thoughts, let's do a quick chart storm just to give visual form to some of these ideas because they're such an incredibly uh, important part of what we're looking at right now. So starting out first, uh, this is just the daily trend in the number of COVID cases in the U.S. You can see, once again, up and to the right, There's you know there are three peaks. The third one is the highest. That's where we are now. Disturbingly, here is the daily trends in the number of deaths from COVID. You can see there looks like there's some periodization in the data. That looks to me like weekend uh, lull in reporting. But the important thing is at the end of this chart, you can see there's a huge leg up in the number of people who are dying. And that, as a consequence, is pushing that moving average, that's the red line, uh, ever higher. Here's a chart that, or rather a map, I should say that uh, I found to be really uh, unusual. If you look at the highest rates of hospitalization, that's the red areas that you're looking at, it's Montana, South Dakota, and Nebraska. These are places that were not hard hit in the first wave. And you can see uh, here in New York, uh, which obviously was hit very hard uh, in the lowest zone in terms of uh, the number of hospitalizations per million cases. Uh, you know, to jump internationally, uh, to your point uh, about Europe, this chart, I think, very disconcerting. This is Europe's COVID-19 resurgence. Uh, you can see this chart is kind of unusually formed, uh, but it's effectively aggregating to together the global regions where COVID uh, has hit, which is effectively the whole world. And what you can see is this huge bulge in the chart on the left. That's the first wave uh, where you have Europe. Uh, and then a little bit later, sl shifted slightly to the right, North America. And now, once again, Europe picking up dramatically, precisely to your point, Ed. And for me, the most dis disconcerting of all of these charts uh, for Americans, uh, it's called fall surge. And here you can see the surge in hospitalization from coronavirus cases uh, now up to a new daily high number of people admitted to the hospital. So the narrative that we'd heard from people uh, who were a little bit more optimistic 
uh, had basically two main points. The first was that it was an unmasking effect caused by additional testing that was causing those numbers to look higher than they were. And the second uh, was that younger and healthier people were getting it and there was going to be less impact because those people were out and about and not in nursing homes. It seems looking at those that last chart, the hospitalization chart, that both of those thoughts are suspect. This looks like a very significant problem. Yeah, and I would say, uh, one, you're being uh, diplomatic, charitable. I mean, they were just completely off, right? Uh, they had blinders on because they didn't want to see what was in front of them. Yes, it is true that we're testing more. And two, by the way, even if you're hospitalized, you know, the hospitalization rate to the death rate is actually lower as well. Yeah. So, it, you know, the, the, the truth of the matter is, is, is that we're much better at dealing with this. But that doesn't mean that we aren't seeing an epidemic increase. When you see the levels of increase in terms of the actual numbers of cases, you can, you don't need all you need is directionality. You don't really need uh, it's not the actual numbers themselves that matter. It's the direction that they're going and over yeah. uh, what time scale that's happening. So when numbers are increasing in terms of the counts by 60 percent, eventually you're going to catch up in terms of the death count as well. So yeah. that that's really what you have to say. And we're still continuing to increase in terms of the actual testing numbers. Uh, you know, the, the number of people who are tested positive. So you can see that the death counts will actually, with a lag, increase continuously. That's really the, the, you know, the whole concept of looking at flow, at looking at the trend as opposed to the absolute numbers, which is what I generally tend to do in terms of economic data as well. So the big question is, is what does that mean in terms of uh, the economy? Because you know, from what I've seen, certainly, and it just uh, in my area, it's been a ghost town at night. So there has been, you know, a palpable change in terms of people's behavior at the margin in terms of certain things. And so it's interesting when you think about the vaccine uh, coming on board and the the massive reaction we had to the vaccine. The question is, is what how what are we supposed to make of the price action in, in markets? You know, you have the stay at home stocks. And then you have the beaten down value stocks, and there's been a rotation trade there. Uh, my view is, is, is that what we've definitely seen is that the prevailing view that the new normal uh, that we've been living in was going to continue, it was probably over overplayed, that there's a reversion to the mean, if you will, in terms of how... Uh, once the once the vaccine comes on board, we're going to unwind some of the behaviors that we've been engaged in. But I think that we're not going to unwind them completely. So some of the you know the things that I'm already seeing in my local area in terms of you know at night people not going out to bars, not going out to restaurants, uh, those are the kinds of things that I think will continue to go on as long as the the pandemic is still a problem and probably even after the fact so there's going to be you know a reversion to uh what we used to have the the old normal but it's not going to go completely in that direction and the question is is what happens in the interim in terms of how much damage is it going to do to certain parts of the economy i think right. that uh there are parts of the economy small businesses leisure uh hospitality and travel that will get hit and some of those companies will go bankrupt. Uh, we already have a shutdown in Europe, so Norwegian Air is a perfect example of this. This is a company that uh, required a bailout from the Norwegian government. If they don't, uh, if things don't improve quickly by the beginning, by the the spring, or sorry, this the winter of 2021, they're going to hit the wall and they'll have to be liquidated. I, I think you'll see similar types of companies here in the United States as well. Yeah, so much there, Ed, to dig into. Uh, you touched on something that I very much wanted to ask you about, uh, which is this rotation and counter rotation. Uh, I'll be diplomatic again. That doesn't really seem to have a great deal of direction or cohesion between growth and value. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, so I mean, I'm thinking about it in terms of the reversion to the mean uh, as well. I saw something that Kevin Muir uh, from the Macro Tourist, what he was writing, he said the Monday uh, rotation trade was the biggest outperformance of value over growth since 2001. And we know, you know, that 2000 to 2002 period was a massive outperformance of of uh, value after we had the the bubble 
of uh, the internet, uh, which which came to a halt. You had people like uh, Julian Robertson, his Tiger Fund. Uh, this is something that Kevin Muir mentioned, closing down. Sim- similar sorts of things are happening now. And so his postulation is, is, is that even though we're giving back some of this rotation, uh, just because, I, as I said, you know, you have a reversion to the mean in terms of certain things, there is a durable, there is potentially a durable uh, shift here that we were way over our skis in terms of the uh, lo- large cap tech and that eventually you have to have the turn and that right. this is as good a time to have the turn as any. Uh, and and we're in the early innings of, of that of that turn. I mean, this is essentially what Jay Pulaski was saying in the interview that I had with him on RVDB. Yeah, for people who haven't seen it, can you summarize his case? Yeah, his case is is, is that you know the markets are forward looking. You know, you buy the rumor, sell the news. The rumor is 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 that we're going to have a vaccine very shortly. F- Pfizer came out with that, and the answer, therefore, based upon that, is to buy up in a massive way. Uh, the the names that have underperformed uh, leisure, hospitality, and uh, travel, and then to sell the stay at home stocks, the likes of Fang, uh, and uh, and then once the news hits, you know, then you can take your profits at that particular juncture. But you know, we had a, a, such a massive move on on uh, Monday and Tuesday that we're already seeing people taking uh, taking the profits. Uh, does that mean that that move doesn't have more uh, more legs? I think it does, but remember, we're in the middle of a pandemic. So, as I said, some some companies are going to hit the wall. Going back to Jack's thesis about these three different uh, these three different stories in Europe and the United States, I think it's very much the case with Bill Ackman talking about you know shorting IG credit. Yeah, there are going to be some downgrades. Uh, we're not out of the woods yet. But still, nonetheless, I think that that rotation does make some sense. Uh, yeah. But it's still very early days in that rotation. Well, now seems like a good time to read through the closing numbers from the day. Uh, so Dow Jones Industrial Average closes at twenty nine three ninety seven. Uh, that's off about uh, zero, uh, about point one percent, point zero eight percent on the day. Uh, S and P five hundred up about three quarters of a percent, up to settle at thirty five seventy two. Uh, the Nasdaq big mover of the day closes at eleven seven eighty six, up two percent on the day. Russell two thousand almost perfectly flat, plus zero point zero zero percent on the day. Yeah, so a bit of a, a change there. So you know, yeah, the a, bit of a, story, a bit of a reversal, but, really. You could say. I mean, yeah. and how, no, I was just going to say, you know, how when I when I look at these, you know, it's I thought it was a great show yesterday with Tony Greer. Oh yeah. Um, and one of the reasons why I like having Tony on so much is because he's very much uh, in a world that I'm not, which is the short-term trading piece, uh, looking at uh, looking at flows, looking at and understanding short-term technical indicators. When I look at this, I think about this obviously more from a strategic standpoint, many uh, ways similar to the way that you look at it. And for me, like I just feel like if one of your coworkers comes in one day and he's wearing like an official MLB jersey from the Yankees and he's wearing a Yankees hat and you're like what's going on man he's like i'm really into the Yankees now you're like all right that's cool but if he comes in the next day and he's just wearing head to toe Mets gear i'm going to be like is everything okay and that's kind of the way i feel about these rotations like i look at this and i understand that you know traders see short term opportunity to move in and out of positions but it just seems like there's a huge amount of churn happening in these markets like there's no clear direction uh, and that you know some of the the strategic stories that we're talking about the virus um, ultimately, some of the things that we're—I know—we're going to touch on uh, a little later about liquidity uh, in markets. These are much more longer-term, durable stories. They're not the kind of thing that turn uh, on a week or a day uh, or a short-term cycle basis. Yeah, and so I think that that you know that you make a lot of sense there. The thing is, is is that uh, we may be in in a shift. I mean, if you think about this, everyone was saying that uh, from a political perspective. Uh, we, we were we called this whole chaos theory too much that actually now we know what the election outcome is going to be. And everyone who was talking about chaos after the election, they didn't know what they were talking about. Uh, you know, they bought all of these uh, these puts and these uh, and these calls on the VIX. And exactly the opposite is happening because we know more. But actually, if you look at the, the real politics, it's we we are in a position where 
one person, the, the incumbent president, is uh, is saying that he doesn't believe the election, and many other people are following along with him. So, you know, we actually have the outcome that people were talking about: a certain level of chaos post-election. Yet, uh, stocks are up. So that does point to uh, some other factors at play over the longer term. That you know, shares want to go up. People, you know, are pushing into the markets, irrespective of what's happening on the ground at any one particular time. Right. Uh, you know, on, on the economic, or rather on the political front, let me uh, run something by you, actually, that we haven't discussed yet. I thought this was interesting. Um, someone was talking about, uh, when people talk about politics and the economy, uh, uh, one thing that comes out is tax policy. And I saw something on Twitter about the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that became law in, in December 2017. AEI, uh, which is generally considered a relatively conservative organization, they did a paper modeling you know, what the implications are. And here's, here's what they came out with. I thought this was kind of interesting. In, they say, in the longer run, as almost all the individual income tax provisions expire in 2025, most households experience a tax hike. However, once we account for the dynamic corporate impacts, most households see an increase in after-tax incomes, with higher income households experiencing significantly larger increases in after-tax incomes relative to lower income households. Now, let me tell you why I'm thinking about this. I'm thinking about this because we're in the middle of a pandemic where we have this so-called K-shaped recovery. People at the bottom echelon, they've just been crushed. People at the top are, are doing really well. And if we think back to 2017, what the AEI is basically saying is they're saying that, number one, the tax cuts as they were drafted are regressive. You know, more of the gains go to the top than to the bottom. Number two, they're saying that actually as drafted, those taxes are due to expire for right. the large majority of Americans by 2025. The decreases are going to expire. Th that, that's right. The tax decreases are going to to go away. Right. And so you uh, you effectively have a tax hike in right. 2025 relative to the period before that. So we're now four, you know, four to five years before, soon four years before that. What is the next administration going to do about this situation, given the baseline that I just mentioned, that pandemic case right. shape, recovery, et cetera. To me, that is the elephant in the room in terms of, you know, what's going to happen uh, durably over the, the longer term. Right. So to the degree that uh, people are talking about uh, Trump, uh, uh, you know, not uh, going along with the, uh, you know, the transition, I think the real political issue is actually what happens in the next uh administration after January the 20th with tax policy. And this, to me, is the most important issue. Well, Ed, these are excellent questions. AEI, of course, is American Enterprise Institute, not known for being a bastion of socialists, certainly, uh, as you say, a bit to the right of center, it's probably fair to say. Uh, you know, Ed, listening to you talk through that, great points, and knowing you as well as I do, you must be thinking in the back of your mind about the MPS, MPC implications. This is the marginal propensity to save versus the marginal propensity to consume uh, in upper income households versus lower income households. Uh, and uh, as we remember from our macroeconomic Economic textbooks, this has a considerable uh, impact on aggregate demand in an economy. The short uh, explanation for this is that uh, when wealthy households receive more income, they tend to save or invest that income. When lower income households uh, receive more income, they tend to spend it uh, or pay down debt, which has a similar effect. So this is something that uh, has not only political implications, uh, but also as exactly as I think you're suggesting, there's significant macroeconomic uh, implications. You know, I would say to me, there's still some uncertainty uh, in with with politics right now in this country with the structure of where government is going to be in 2021. I mean, I expect and, you know, I don't usually give my opinions, but my expectation is that based on everything that I've read, being watching politics for as long as I have, that this seems like eventually President Trump is going to have no choice but to concede because it looks like there's just a very strong numerical case for the fact that he lost the election in the Electoral College, uh, and that there's not going to be a reversal. You know, if you look at these stories uh, about uh, about recounts and about when they go and they do these uh, when they do these uh, basically look back and 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 go through these votes, 
you see changes of 50, 100, 150, right. 200 votes. Yeah. They're not multiple thousands of votes. And, and I think that the support, if you think about the politics here, and this is always a bit dangerous to speculate because you're thinking about optics, but it really seems to me like the people in the president's party, you know, they know their base is very positive for Trump. Uh, there's really not much downside for them to say, you know, I support the president. Uh, let's let this play out through the courts. He has access to the courts. He has recourse to the courts. It's his right to go through this process. But when those moves start going against him, I, I think that they're going to break very quickly uh, and accept Joe Biden as the next president of the United States. That's not my my political opinion. That's just looking at the math and understanding the way politics generally works in this country. But the thing that's interesting to me is to think about this runoff election. I think it's uh, January 5th, is it? Uh, in uh, in the state of Georgia, two Senate seats. This could be absolutely crucial. Fiscal policy, obviously the concern of Congress. So I think there's a lot of indeterminacy here, uncertainty around whether or not uh, we have Mitch McConnell as Senate uh, majority leader uh, again for the next term between uh, 2020 and 2022. Yes. Yeah, so I think uh, in that vein, I say. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, 21 and 23, I mean, in that vein, the question becomes, uh, you know, on tax policy, uh, at, at the margin, you, if you said, let's make the tax uh, cuts for the, uh, you know, for normal, ordinary Americans permanent, just like we did with the corporate uh, side of things, that would mean that's not increasing the size of government, but it is going to increase deficits. Would a Republican a Senate go along with that? Then on the other hand, Joe Biden has said, actually, I want to not just do that. I want to, you know, increase the progressivity of the tax uh, base. I want to go back to the tax levels before uh, the Trump uh, tax cuts to, uh, for those more wealthy Americans. Is a Republican Senate going to go along with that? So when you talk about marginal propensity to consume and to save, I think that's where we're getting into this whole concept of you know, who's go where's the the money coming from? Who's going to get what they're getting? Even if you forget all about any sort of, you know, uh, uh, government spending, if you just look at it just from a purely taxational perspective, I think that this 2017 bill, which was highly regressive in terms of its impact, that it can be undone. But will it be undone given the politics? I think that it's highly dubious. So, uh, going back to our whole conversation about what the impact of the pandemic is going to be on the economy, it's the jury's still out in terms of what the impact is. But increasingly, as the numbers of COVID cases tick up, all of these issues are going to come into play. And to the degree that uh, it does have a negative impact, you're going to need to have some sort of fiscal response. Uh, and these are the issues that I think are the most important to think about uh, in regard to that response. Uh, going forward. Yeah, extremely well said, Ed. I should say, just in, in the interest of, of uh, obviously, we, we don't just present uh, one side of the story. Uh, some things that I thought were very heartening today, uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci was speaking at, I think, a Financial Times conference uh, and had some very positive things to say about the Pfizer uh, BioNTech vaccine and said that he expects similar results uh, from another U.S. biotech company called Moderna. Uh, because their vi vaccine is uh, substantively similar uh, to the uh, to the Pfizer vaccine, and so uh, the potential for more positive data coming out for a second vaccine, which obviously um, is something that all of us are hoping and praying for. Yeah, so I mean, the the, the markets should be forward looking, but they can't look too far forward because we're about to hit a, a, a wave that will have some disparate impact on companies. And I think uh, particularly in those uh, those sectors of the economy that people had been rotating into on Monday and Tuesday, the, the you know, the, the next thing on my mind, I think, which you foreshadowed before was the liquidity. Yeah, because I there's a piece that's coming out tomorrow with Michael Howell. I spoke to him and basically he's pretty bullish on 2021. Uh, and the reason that he's so bullish is because because of a global wave of liquidity. We're not talking about just the U.S., but we're talking globally. What he's seen is a massive wave of liquidity uh, relative to uh, you know the previous numbers. So we're seeing we're talking about a 15 percent increase in liquidity, and the concomitant increase in asset prices hasn't come. And so he sees asset prices uh, shooting up 
in 2021. And uh, let me just take a look at my notes uh, from that uh, that conversation here. Um, Hal said, based upon that, that uh, he believes that uh, Bitcoin will hit uh, uh, 25,000 and that gold will hit 2,500 and yields will hit 2% uh, on the back of inflation as this takes hold in 2021. So very big calls on his part. I think uh, it's a must watch interview. And yeah. uh, I think that it's definitely going against the grain of some of the things that I've been talking about, at least over the this short to medium term. He's thinking 2021 is going to be positive because the, the wall of liquidity will, will just overwhelm everything else. Yeah. And I'm not even going to try and hide this one. This is just a shameless plug. It's a great interview. I got to see a portion of it uh, earlier today. Uh, you did a great job asking these questions, really digging in. Mike Howell, uh, one of my favorite Real Vision guests, he's been looking at precisely these issues uh, for 30 years now, I think going back to his, uh, his days at Solomon Brothers, uh, and uh, a really deep analytic look uh, that you walk through with Mike Howell. Some numbers that struck me, global liquidity up 20 trillion. Uh, that's a quarter of global GDP. Uh, central banks have put in 6 billion so far uh, and increased their balance sheets by a third. Uh, that is for the, uh, the time period, I believe, uh, just 2020. Uh, he talks about competitively, uh, comp relatively low uh, exposure to equity by investors, uh, and then he, which is the point that you're talking about now, the potential for upside there. But interestingly enough, one of the things we talk about on this show so often uh, is looking at things across different time horizons. This idea that we are building this liquidity uh, debt axis that has the potential to create a liquidity and debt spiral. Um, he said. I thought one of the most ominous phrases, which was every turn of the spiral raises credit risks. Liquidity is papering over the cracks uh, and uh, and debt is wonderful collateral until it isn't. Well, you know, the, the thing is, he was, I think, positive in a way that uh, uh, Bill Ackman's not, because mm. I think that the story is, is he's saying 2021 is shaping up to be bullish and those cracks will be papered over. So to the degree that uh, you have refinancing risk, is, which is what he's talking about. Yeah. Uh, he believes that uh, the the powers that be will step in to to fill those holes, to fill those gaps. So IG credit, it's not going to be a problem. Maybe you might have some uh, problems and junk, but he believes that they will step in. Now, you know, the way that I'm looking at it, uh, because on the um, uh, the liquidity side, you're looking at you know uh, banks and you're looking at central banks pumping money in. That's the, the, the supply. Then you have the, uh, uh, the assets that they're, they're buying. You know, we're talking about world assets, global assets. You could buy uh, houses, you could buy uh, uh, gold, you can buy financial assets, the whole bit. So he's looking at a, a global system and he's looking at global liquidity and, and world asset prices. And what he's seen, therefore, is is you know because money is fungible and you can it can go in different places. The way to think about it is is if if the money is there to buy something, uh, then the more of that that you have, the the higher the prices will go. That's right. that's in a nutshell what's happening. So if you have over the course of 2020 uh, global liquidity going up almost 20 percent. It's almost uh, a guarantee that world asset prices have to go up in concert with that, and they have not; they've yet to do so thus far. And this is his case for why things will go up in 2021. And if you so, if you look at it just at a micro level, what does that mean? That means that you have to paper over the cracks. That means that when problems come up, the central banks will step in and and provide that liquidity to get over the cracks, and as a result. It'll keep the wave moving forward. So very, a very interesting thesis. I'm not sure where I stand on that, how, what I believe, but I found it very fascinating, uh, interesting, and uh, I just found it uh, something that, to, to put into my register as to how to think about the world. Yeah, that's a very well contextualized uh, vision of a, a very complicated and analytic thesis uh, that that Mike puts forward. You know, to, to your point, it seems as though he's certainly more bullish uh, in the short term 
uh, than, say, Bill Ackman is on credit, uh, but may actually ultimately be more bearish in the long term. Uh, with that said, I should probably say it's just way too complex and nuanced to summarize uh, here. It's, it's like an hour long interview. Definitely check it out. This is uh, much see watching uh, for anyone who is a serious nerd on financial markets, Ed Harrison and uh, Mike Howell. So, I mean, that uh, that in a nutshell is everything that I'm thinking about. There are one or two other things that, that are on my mind right now. But I think that uh, uh, we, we have a, uh, if I could sum it up, in the United States, we have relatively good uh, lagging to coincident data. Uh, and we have a, a torrent of co uh, coronavirus cases coming going forward. At the same time, we have a, a, a monster amount of global liquidity that has hit uh, the economy, which is is waiting there to to uh, buy up asset prices, whether it be houses, whether it be you know financial assets, and so this is a situation where you have a lot of moving parts that are moving in opposite directions at the same time. So I think that we're at a, a, speci a specifically critical juncture in all of this, not just politically, but also in terms of uh, you know where the market is headed over the the over the medium term so I, I don't have a specific view as to how this is going to uh to play out i do think that there are more risks to the downside uh than there are uh upside but uh, michael howell's giving you a, a reason to believe the opposite yeah so uh take a look you, you will enjoy this piece so uh ash as always thank you and uh i think that's it for us this week uh, you're talking to raul on friday we'll be back at it on monday yes sir thank you for joining us